Okay, Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 28. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I've chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. I believe this is a really powerful passage. And what I want to do is really dig into it. Let me give you a preview of the two things that I want to talk about today. First, I want to talk about what this passage reveals about Jesus. And then I want to talk about what this passage reveals about our faith in Jesus as a consequence. This passage has so many tremendous things to say about Jesus, and so that's where we're going to start. And what it reveals is that Jesus is full of glory and splendor and majesty, that he's the source of divinity, that he's the center of history, that he's the hope of the Bible, that he's the savior of the world, and so much more. Um, let's start looking at this uh, kind of one thing at a time. First, the description of his appearance and what it reveals. So he takes these three disciples, Peter, James, and John. They go up onto a mountain to pray. It says, while they were praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. So in just a moment's notice, everything changed, and Jesus became absolutely brilliant. Here, he's described like a flash of lightning. In Matthew chapter 17, it says his face shone like the sun. And I mean, I want you to just for a moment imagine what this must have been like, how blinding it was. You know what it's like to look up at the sun. And the sun's at such a distance that you can kind of look, but you, you can't quite take it in because it's so brilliant. Here Jesus is standing right next to them. And whether you think about a flash of lightning, just brilliant and blazing, or the sun, I mean, it was, it was the kind of thing that was almost too much to take in. It speaks about his clothes here in Mark chapter 9. It says his clothes became dazzling white whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. So, you know, Mark is struggling to describe for us how blindingly pure Jesus suddenly appeared, right? I mean, what is a white, whiter than any bleach can bleach, right? How white is that? And all the gospel writers, they're, they're just attempting to somehow say like, the brilliance, the splendor, the glory that was coming off of Jesus, it was more than a person could take in. In that moment, Jesus, it was like he became unveiled. Maybe this is the wrong time of year, but you know the Christmas song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King. One of the verses, uh, this is the line that said, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. As I think what that song is getting at is that Jesus in his earthly ministry, uh, the glories of his divinity were veiled by his fleshly reality. But in this moment on the mountaintop, uh, it was like the veil was lifted and the glory that Jesus had, the glory of God, just came 
pouring out. And the disciples saw Jesus for who he really was, blindingly brilliant, completely pure, glorious in every way, majestic. I mean, whatever adjective I could use right now, that's what they're trying to communicate. And, you know, while I'm talking about veils, uh, this incident, if you're a student of the Bible, will call to mind something from the Old Testament. I don't know if you remember this, but in the Old Testament, when God called the Israelites out of Egypt and Moses was their leader, he brought them to Mount Sinai, and God descended on that mountain, and Moses went up to meet him face to face, where God with his own finger inscribed the Ten Commandments on two tablets. Anyway, when Moses came down the mountain, here's what the Bible says. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant of the law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. And apparently, just because he had been in God's presence and his face began somehow to reflect God's presence, his face was like glowing and radiant in such a way that, and the Bible describes this, it creeped out all the people who saw him. And they were so disturbed by the radiant face of Moses that if you, and you can read this later, go back and look at Exodus chapter 34, Moses would put a veil down over his face so that people could talk to him. In the Old Testament, Moses was reflecting. He had been in the presence of God. He started to reflect that glory in his face. And the reason I bring this up here is because there's something totally different. Jesus is not reflecting the glory of God. This passage is telling us that he's the source of the glory of God. That in distinction from Moses, when he lifted his veil, it was divinity itself that was pouring out. And so Jesus was seen in all his brilliance, all his power, all his glory, all his majesty, all his purity, all his light. And it was blinding. That's the idea here. So, from the physical description, second way in which we see it in this passage, who Jesus is, is from the company that he kept there on the top of the mountain. So, if you look at verse 30, it says there were two men, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glorious splendor and were talking with Jesus. So, you know, Peter, James, and John are there. All of a sudden, whoosh, you know, they're blown away. And then the two central figures of history up until that time, Moses and Elijah, showed up and were talking to him. And here, important for a couple reasons, Moses and Elijah represent in the Old Testament the law and the prophets. The one person associated with the law is Moses. The preeminent prophet was Elijah. Now these two men whoosh, are there with Jesus. They're talking to him, uh, adding to the splendor of the moment, the law and the prophets. Uh, this is important for a couple of different reasons, one of which is this, that throughout Jesus' ministry, he was accused of a couple things. He was accused of being a lawbreaker, he was accused of being a false prophet. And I won't get into it now, but if you want to look it up later, even in the Gospel of Luke, you'll find people, for instance, in Luke chapter 6, saying, hey, aren't you a lawbreaker? Or in Luke chapter 6, say, you're a false prophet. So Jesus is being accused of those things. And now it becomes obvious he's neither one. In fact, Moses and Elijah are somehow or another, their presence is commending Jesus to all of us as though they're putting their stamp of approval, like here he is. And in New Testament terms, Jesus himself came and he said things like this, I haven't come to abolish the law and the prophets. Jesus says, I've come to fulfill them so that all of the Bible's history, somehow or another, and you can see it this way, is pointing to me. And so their presence there with Jesus on that mountain shows to anyone who ever looks on that Jesus is the center of history. 
that he is the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament, that he is the fulfillment of all the law, he is the fulfillment of all prophecy, he is the expected center of history, the chosen one. So, just kind of building a case here, what you've got to see about Jesus. His physical appearance is making a case, something we have to see about him. The company he's keeping. And now I, I want to look at what God the Father says about him. And so hopefully you still have your Bibles open. I want you to look at verse 35. There in verse 35 it says this, a voice came from the cloud, which by the way, uh, cloud throughout the Old Testament was uh, synonymous with the presence of God. So this is the voice of God the Father. And this voice says, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Uh, just reading and I'm struck that I need a deeper voice to get across what this must have been like for the God of heaven in an audible way to, to speak something. And just, okay, let's do some Bible trivia. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, God speaks two times from heaven. What are those two times? Do you know? Okay, someone yelled it out, the baptism. The first time God speaks from heaven is at the baptism. Jesus is coming up out of the water. The heavens split. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. And God, the Father Almighty, says, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. And, all right, if you're awake and listening to me, you now know the second time, right? It's right here at the transfiguration. And God says, this is my son whom I've chosen, listen to him. Now, I want you to be impressed that it was just at crucial moments where God chose to spoke, speak with an audible voice. And now I just want you to see this, that he didn't spare any words, and each word he spoke was imbued with even deeper significance than we see at first glance. Here's the reason why Bible scholars ha have almost universally seen this, that each one of the phrases here is tied to a major point in the Old Testament. So as an example, in the time of the kings, when each new king came to the throne, there was a psalm that was used at the coronation, Psalm 2. This psalm that was used at the coronation of each new king contained a line. I'll just put the line here on the screen, verses 7 and 8, where there'd be a proclamation somehow that this king is a royal son. And there was a declaration of faith that the Israelites had that although they were a tiny country, surrounded by huge empires, that one day, one of David's descendants would not just rule a small tract of land, but would rule from sea to sea, that all the nations would be his inheritance, that all the, the nations would become his possession. And so there was this expectation that there would be a king, a royal son, a descendant of David who would truly rule over every nation of the world. So when the Father from heaven said, this is my son, you see the echoes of Psalm 2 behind it. Also, during the time of the prophets, the prophet Isaiah began to speak about this Messiah, a suffering servant who would make the world right again, who would forgive sins and trespasses and guilt, who would lay down his life and suffer on behalf of others to set people free. And in particular, in Isaiah chapter 42, when this servant is described, God speaks about him and says, this is my chosen one. And so that phrase, my chosen one, whom I have chosen, this is my son whom I've chosen, 
has echoes from the prophets where there's a suffering servant who's going to come and make the world right and bring justice to every place under the sky. And one more thing, back in the time of Moses, Moses spoke about how after Moses there would be another prophet, in fact a prophet greater than he was, who would be trustworthy and true, and you could hang on his words. Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses says this, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. Do you see that? So there's three key places in scripture from the kings, from the prophets, from the time of Moses, that it's as though God is drawing up all of biblical history And when he says, just in the compact way, this is my son whom I have chosen, listen to him. He's he's commending Jesus to us. This is the royal son. This is the suffering Messiah and Christ and servant. This is the trustworthy and true prophet. And so, I mean, we've gone through this now, his appearance The company kept the words that were spoken from God the Father in heaven. And I just want you to see it. Jesus, blindingly pure, amazingly majestic. The veil has come off. He is the center of deity himself, right? The center of history, the fulfillment of the entire New Testament, the royal son, the chosen servant, the trustworthy prophet. He is the one. Now, still talking about Jesus, one more thing I want you to see. Would you look with me at verse 31? It says in verse 31, they, now speaking about Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, spoke about his departure. That's an interesting word. Which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. The Greek word, which stands behind the word departure, is the word exodus. Maybe you recognize that word? It's uh, one of the books of the Old Testament, exodus. The exodus was all about God setting his people free. It was about a deliverance. It's about a redemption. And so when you read here, they spoke about Jesus' exodus. There's a purpose to what's about to happen in Jerusalem. Now, I want you to see one more thing. Look at the beginning of verse 28. It says, about eight days after Jesus said this. Now, I want to just pause here for a second, help everyone kind of think about how to read the Bible. Sometimes we read the Bible just like I did this morning in little chunks. We just take a little bit of the time. We fail to see the context. And this passage actually begins in such a way that Jesus had just gotten done saying something. And that thing he just got done saying is super important if you want to understand what's happening here during the transfiguration. What did Jesus just get done saying? And here's what it is. And if you look at each one of the Gospels, you'll see that this is the, this is the order of events in each Gospel. That at the center point of Jesus' life... He gathers his disciples together. And if you look back up at verse 18, he gathers his disciples, he asks them a question. Who do the crowds say that I am? And they all reply and they say, well, some people are saying you're John the Baptist and other people are saying you're Elijah and still others, one of the prophets of long ago who's come back to life. And then Jesus, he asks this question, what about you, disciples, you've been with me. Who do you say that I am? And Peter It's a stunning moment. It's the pinnacle in each gospel. He confesses out loud on behalf of all the disciples, this is what we think, you are God's Messiah. Other gospels record that he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And in that moment, Jesus says, I tell you what, Peter, you got it. And it's not only that, but on your confession, I will build my church. But then he tells everyone, okay, shh. Don't tell anybody. And the reason he says, shh, don't tell anyone, is no one understands yet what kind of Messiah he intends to be. 
They're expecting someone who's going to conquer and show power and throw off the Romans. And no, he's a suffering Messiah. And he explains, if you look at verse 22, the kind of Messiah he's going to be. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So, shh, don't tell anyone yet who I am because no one's going to get what I'm about to do. All right, let's pause for a minute. You know I'm kind of visual. I like to draw drawings, so here we go. Let's talk about Jesus' life. I think there's a kind of arc that if you read through the Gospels, you'll see to his life. Uh, I'm going to just start out by, I drew it in yellow first. I'm going to come back and draw it in black. It's as though it kind of goes up, it gets to a pinnacle, and then falls back down. So let's, let's talk our way through. First, it seems to go up. Jesus, if you will, bursts on the scene. There are miracles. There's healing. The sick are being brought to him, and they're being healed. The lame are being brought to him, they're being restored. People are losing their minds. This is amazing. Crowds are gathering. They're, they're in awe of his teaching ability. When he speaks, people are hanging on his every word. Word is going out like, we've never seen anything like this before. This is amazing. He's calming storms simply by telling the wind, be quiet. The hungry are being fed. Those who have suffered for years on end are being released from that suffering. In fact, dead people are being raised to life. And if I can just put it this way, it seems to be going up, up, up. People are asking, what is about to happen? This is amazing. God is breaking through in a kind of power no one has ever seen. It's unbelievable. Okay, then right at the center, there is an announcement that Jesus is in fact exactly who everyone is thinking. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. And right at the center, Jesus lets it out, hey, I'm just wanting to let you know, I'm going to, I just drew a little cross there. I'm headed to the cross. And people are like, no, that's not going to happen. You're going up, up, up. Jesus is saying, no. I'm going to go down, down, down. But right after this announcement, in each of the Gospels, there's this account of the transfiguration, where at the very top of this ark, he takes him up on a high mountain. And, uh, okay, that's my best attempt at a mountain. He goes up on a high mountain, and there, right in their presence, he is transfigured before them. He stands bare, his divinity now made evident, his glory just expressly open, his, his blindingly pure and radiant, he's the center of history. Everything we've said uh, is revealed and made plain. And then if you keep reading the Gospels, he heads toward Jerusalem. His disciples sell him out. He winds up crying in a garden. He's arrested. His closest friends scatter. He's left alone. He's tried. He's beaten. He's whipped. He's scourged. People gather around him and mock him. They assault him in every way, physically, emotionally. I mean, he's brought so low in every imaginable way, left alone, finally, to the point where he's hanging on the cross, crying out, God, why have even you forsaken me? And I don't think in this moment I can even do justice to describe the depths to which Jesus descended. 
But of course, I think it's important that I say this. Back to verse 31, while they're up on the mountain, they're speaking about his departure. Of course, when they're speaking about his departure, it's a reference to the cross, what he's about to suffer. But the word is exodus. This is redemption. This is slaves being set free. This is people being redeemed, and it's something greater than what happened in the time of Moses. And I think it's just good for a moment to talk about this. Why here? Why now on the mountaintop? Why does Jesus in that moment unveil himself and show all his glory and power? Here's why. Because otherwise, we might think as he descends, it's because he lacks power, that he's weak, that he couldn't do it, that he got drug away. I mean, he's healing, he's, he's doing all these, he's going up, 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 but he couldn't sustain it, and uh, he was overcome. But I think, if I can put it this way, <laughs> I'll just back up. I think it's like God on top of that mountain was turning to us, and here, I, I don't know if everyone see this, he, it was like he was winking, right? Like, hey, I'm not being dragged away. I'm not unwilling. This didn't come upon me because I was overcome. I'm willingly going there. This is my plan. This is why I came. And I just think it's important to pause for a second and say this. This is the good news of the gospel. That even though we were sinners, that we were lost and far from God, because of his righteousness, he couldn't wrap his arms around us anymore, and we were cut off from him, left to die. God loved us so much that he entered this world for that purpose, to come and set us free, to redeem us, to buy us back, to make us free, to release us. Uh, when you look at the cross, it, it's not a loss. Every Christian who looks at the cross says, that's a victory. So even though he went down, 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 all those who now put their faith and trust in Jesus recognize that their sins have been taken off them. They've been put on Jesus. He was punished in our place. We are free. We are redeemed. We are, we are given a brand new life. We are raised to life with Jesus. It's not a loss. It's a victory. Okay. I told you here was my plan. First, tell us what this passage has to say about Jesus. And now I hope this gets really good. Let's talk about, now that we've seen this about Jesus, what this matters for faith in Jesus. So here, I think three things. If we think all these things about Jesus, what does, what does it say about faith in Jesus? Well, first, we're going to talk about what faith understands. Then we'll talk about what faith defeats, namely fear. Then let's talk about what faith prays, and we'll close it out. So, what faith understands. Okay, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, it is going to have a different character than any other religion, and here's why. Because no matter your circumstance, uh, you are going to view through a different lens. Uh, maybe I can put it this way. Let's just talk about this side, right? When things are going well. Okay, when things are going well and it seems like God's blessing, you can say to yourself, wow, God's there. So, uh, you know, a miracle happens. You're sick and, and, and you're healed. Your relationship's falling apart and all of a sudden God breaks through. Uh, when God shows up in power, right? This is what we're talking about on the way up. You say, okay. I knew God would do that. That's awesome. God, you're there. And uh, your faith is bolstered. That's where God's powerful. That's where he's present. And you're right. But if you're a Christian, I also want you to see this. That on this side, when things are falling apart, faith sees that God is also working. Maybe I'll put it this way. Faith sees, perhaps, that God is working more powerfully. Okay? I just got sick. You could say, well, what is this? Faith 
helps us to say that even in weakness, God's strong. My relationship is falling apart. You know what? This world's not spinning out of control. Jesus is controlling it all. Uh, my business is falling apart. My job is just spinning out of control. No. Even in this moment, your faith will help you to see God is doing something. And you may not know what it is, but you will know for sure that even when you're weak, that's where Jesus is all the stronger. Here, we just got to like kick into Romans chapter 8 because you just got to. We know that in, here's two words, all things. Not just the good times, but also the bad times. In all things, God is working for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. If you're a Christian, if things are going well, bless God, thank him. That's awesome. If things are not going well, be patient. He may be doing something far more profound in your life than he was before when things were on their way up. Does that make sense? That's what Christian faith understands. Man, I got to just keep riffing on Romans chapter 8. Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of God? Look at the list he makes. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Maybe we can put in or sickness or in broken relationships or in a job spinning out of control. Is there anything? He says, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Do you understand this? The worst thing in the world that could ever happen right there. The cross of Jesus Christ, and what is it? The most profound victory three days later raised from the dead. Do you see that? Man, what is happening in your life? It is not a defeat. If you are putting your faith in Jesus Christ, you are not in the process of being defeated. You are in the process of realizing a tremendous victory. That is what faith understands. Okay, what faith defeats? Fear. I'm doing my best to tell you the good news that this Bible proclaims. You're going to walk out the door, and the world is going to do its best to tell you a bunch of bad news. Okay? Turn on any news broadcast. What are they pounding into your head? Bad news, bad news, bad news. The world's falling apart. Everything's coming undone. Okay? In our lives, I mean, you just pick it up from other people. Fear, anxiety, worry, concern. I've got an ache in my side. Oh, man, that's what my grandmother died from. I'm done in. Right? I'm having, I'm having miscommunication with my spouse. Oh, she's about to leave me. Right? Man, I've had a bad quarter in my business. Everything's doomed. I mean, this world is beating on you with bad news, and I know that. So I'm just standing up here today to say, no. Even if it looks like it's not going well, it looks like it's going down, I want you to know that in Jesus Christ, if you have faith, it defeats fear. Faith and fear, they share something in common. It takes the same energy, really. In both fear and faith, we imagine what we cannot see yet, right? So if you're afraid, you're just thinking, oh, this terrible thing's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet, but you're just imagining it in your mind. Oh, no. Right? But if you have faith, you begin to imagine something different. Wow. I know it doesn't look good yet, but I just know. Right? You're, you just you think and you dwell on, I know that I know that I know I belong to Jesus Christ. And even in times of weakness or trouble or difficulty, what, what do I see? I see Christ, I see the cross, I see that God is bringing about all things for my good. Does that make sense? Faith defeats fear, which is why Jesus says, do not worry. What can worrying do? Each day has enough, enough trouble of its own, and it takes the same energy. Faith and fear take the same energy. All right, finally, what faith prays? Man, I want to help you with this. We're in the middle of 40 days of prayer, and I want you to just take in what we've just learned about Jesus. I want you to think about what faith means, and then I want you to think about prayer. 
So I started off this 40 days of prayer, and we started talking about the Lord's Prayer, which is recorded in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, okay, this is how, not what, but how you should pray. And then it starts off with an address, our Father in heaven. And then there are six requests. The first three are directed to God, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. See, your, 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 they're all directed toward God. And then there are three requests which are directed toward our needs, our concerns. So give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And it's so profound because in this prayer, we pray for everything we need, past, present, future. So give us today, present. Forgive us our debts, that's the past. Lead us not into temptation, that's the future. Everything we need physically, spiritually, morally. Give us today our daily bread, that's what we need physically. Right? Forgive us our debts, that's what we need spiritually. Lead us not into temptation, that's what we need morally. So every aspect of our life, we, we humbly come before God and we're invited to just lay it ahead of his feet. Do you have a worry? Do you have a concern? Do you have a trouble? The God of the universe is inviting you to come to your Father and just humbly lay it at his feet. Okay, now, some of us, probably you were surprised because when we went through this, you read this in Matthew's Gospel and you said, wait a second. When I was taught the Lord's Prayer, there was still another line. You know, but when I read it in Matthew, that line's missing. This is the line you were taught. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Were you taught that line when you were taught the Lord's Prayer? Everybody? Let me tell you why. Why do Christians end with that line? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We end with that line because... We end our prayer with this incredible line of faith. Okay, God, I just got diagnosed. But yours is a kingdom. Yours is a power. Yours is a glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, God, I'm losing my job. But yours is a kingdom. Yours is a power. Yours is a glory forever and ever. Amen. God, my relationships are falling apart. I think my spouse might leave me. My kids won't talk to me. But yours is a kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever and ever. And man, if there's one thing I could teach you today, it'd be this. That in your prayer life, no matter what you're going through, no matter what the struggle, no matter how many things seem to be going down, 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 that because you're a believer in Jesus Christ, no matter how forlorn or desperate or concerned you get, you humbly lay him before Jesus, and then you just boldly confess even though I can't see how, even though I don't know why, even though my eyes can't behold it yet, I know, because I, I look at the cross every day, that there's a victory. Yours is a kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Forever and ever and ever, it will never come to an end. Amen. Amen. And... Uh, that's the prayer. That is the prayer that faith brings. And I just suggest it changes everything. And so that's what we're going to do. Right now, we're going to end in prayer. I just invite everyone, close your eyes, lift up your heart to God. I have no doubt that you brought burdens through these doors today. We're going to corporately lift them to God, and then we're just going to pray a prayer of faith together. Will you join your heart together with mine?